Good morning. It's 11 o'clock on uh, Thursday, the um, 28th of October, 2015. As you can see, Valentino is uh, not sleeping. He's uh, doing the other thing, <laughs> the other thing that he really likes to do. And um, we're enjoying a nice day here. I was going to go out and finish raking or, or blowing the leaves together and gathering them up. And while I was still in bed this morning, I heard uh, a leaf blower, and it turns out that my friends here from the um, this color is kind of weird. My friends here from the um, Oh, from the town, the workers from the town, and by the way, uh, they're um, uh, there are some people from Syria here uh, who are working with the with them. I don't think they get paid for it, but they're just glad they have something to do. And they uh, cleaned up all my leaves, got to got them all out of there. So um, I'm very pleased about that. I'll buy them a case of beer or something. I have to figure out what I'm going to do to thank them. They did the, they did this last year too, and uh, I'm that of course takes a big load off my off my back, literally. This is a response actually to uh, to uh, our good friend Harry Faber. Uh, if you haven't watched his recent video. On communication, I suggest you do that. It's a very, some very good thoughts, and I want, I certainly want. Uh, this is a response to him, but I certainly agree with him. It's not in any way a refutation. Uh, Harry came to the conclusion basically that uh, if you want to understand someone, you can, regardless of what language it's in, and that language, that communication isn't really a question of language, it's a question of um, of uh, two people, for instance, trying, or two people, or as he said, 200 people, trying to understand one another, and they will, if they want to. And I think we can certainly see that that is true, because uh, we know that people who grow up in the same town together, who speak the same language and the same uh, dialect uh, don't understand one another basically because they don't really want to understand one another is the way i see it um, or they haven't learned they haven't learned how i'm going to tell you a story about i'll tell you a couple of stories actually that have to do with language and about uh getting along in a country or in a place where you don't uh, can't communicate verbally in the normal manner uh at, as most of you know, I was born in, this, in the United States, and I grew up there, um, at least physically grew up there. And uh, when I was 20, I think 24, I left the States and came to Europe and settled down in Germany. And I've lived in Germany ever since, and uh, I'm, well, I'm not as fluent in, Ger well, I don't know if you could say that, but in any case, I'm, I'm no more or less no, I'm no less confusing in German than I am in English. Let's put it that way. Uh, in the meantime, I've had it for 40 years or 45 years almost. I had to give lectures in German, so uh, I'm relatively proficient in German now. But in the beginning, of course, it was very difficult. Uh, as I've mentioned in some of my videos, I uh, learned to speak what I call Tankstellen Deutsch, uh, uh, filling station in German uh, because we had an old Fiat that broke down all the time. So I, I literally knew the word for head gasket before I knew the word, knew, knew how to say, uh, to say hello. Um, this was very, it wasn't easy. I had a dictionary. I used the dictionary and uh, I found out that dictionaries don't oftentimes don't have a lot of details about um about uh, automobile repairs, uh, so a lot of it was done with uh, hands. 
Oh, speaking of hands, I have a guitar. Harry entertained us love by by playing the guitar. He's getting very good, and I used to play the guitar. I um, was good enough, in fact, that I played in a group when I was in college. Uh, we so this was in the folk folk song years with uh, with Phil Collins. No, that's not right. Uh, now forget that. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, Peter Paul and Mary, let's let's just say Peter Paul and Mary, and um, Bob Dylan and so on, and uh, so I actually did play guitar, and I have a very nice guitar. I was going to get it here and show it to you, but it's uh, it's just a guitar. It's a very nice one that was built by a an old German man in the town of Tübingen, south of. Stuttgart. Uh, I went to the university in Turingen and the Max Planck Institute there, and uh, he was he was probably in his seventies when he built my guitar. And um, I wish I could play it for you, but my hands uh, are so uh, deformed from rheumatoid arthritis that I can't play any instrument anymore. I can't play the clarinet anymore, and I can't play the piano. So I won't be able to entertain you with music like Harry does, but I will tell you a couple of stories about communication. One of them uh, was when we were traveling from Germany to Turkey. And uh, as you, if you're not up on geography, uh, Turkey is southeast of Germany. You have to drive through Austria, and one the way we did it was to drive through Austria and what was at that time called U Yugoslavia, um, mostly through Serbia. And uh, in Zagreb, we had some mechanical problems. That, that was interesting. However, the main mechanic there spoke, spoke uh, uh, fluent German, so it wasn't really a serious problem. But from there, you have to turn left. And in Zagreb, you turn left and go, go east through Bulgaria. And at that time, this is 1960, uh, 1969, I believe. In 1969, Bulgaria was still, uh, of course, a communist nation. It was under the was under the the iron hand of Russia and uh, uh, the government. The the Bulgarian government, of course, was not friendly to Western uh, governments, and um, it felt just ex it felt very exciting. It felt very dangerous uh, going into Bulgaria because Bulgaria at the time was really un an unknown. People didn't really know much about it, from people from the West, I mean. Very few people had ever been there. And um, we drove into Bulgaria, and the roads were okay, we, but we had to go through the mountains north of uh, Sofia. And we were up in the mountains quite high, and we went, we drove through a village uh, not a village, but a town, a small town, and we saw people carrying big loaves, of beautiful loaves of bread under their arm. They had a, they all had a big loaf of bread under their arm, and so we drove in the opposite direction from which they were coming to see, or I mean, in the direction from which they were coming, so that we could see if we could find the bakery where we could buy a loaf of bread. Well, we uh, finally did. We saw. It wasn't a bakery, it was just an outlet, basically, in an old building. And I'm sure I have a slide of this somewhere, and it's, it's too bad, but I just can't find my slides at the moment, so I have to do this without any pictures. You have to look at Valentino here. He's, he's uh, now resting again after, after, after dining. Um, this, basically, it looked like an old storefront in a, in a, American Western movie, and people were coming out with these big loaves of bread. So we parked the car, which wasn't a problem because there were almost no cars in in Bulgaria at that time. We parked the car and went into this place, and everybody kind of just moved aside when they saw us in because they knew we weren't 
we weren't locals. And they probably hadn't seen foreigners, I imagine, imagining. Uh, they probably had never, maybe some of them had never seen people outside of their neighbors before. So we walked in and we smiled and we, none of us spoke any Russian, none of us spoke anything that approached Bulgarian. So, um, we tried in German. Nobody spoke there and he spoke any, he spoke any German. And, but we pointed at the bread and, and said one, we wanted one, one. And, um, they understood very quickly, of course. Everybody was trying to help. Every, you could tell they were all talking to one another about what, you know, to do. So they s looked for the nicest loaf of bread that they had that was baked perfectly. It was, it was interesting. They, they were arguing about which, which loaf was the best one. And finally, they gave us what they considered the best one. And all of a sudden, we, you could see that the man that was in charge, more or less, you could see the problem arise in his eyes. His eyes opened and he realized there was a serious problem. And the serious problem was this. The people there did not pay for their bread. They got a loaf of bread every day from the state. That was their allotment. And they didn't pay for it. It was part of living there. In other words, he had no cash register. He had never taken money for a loaf of bread before. So, so he went over to the to the wall and he actually had a telephone with a with a uh, um, an earpiece that hung down and he held it to his ear and cranked the knob on the wooden telephone and he spoke very loudly over the telephone. Of course we couldn't understand a word. And all of a sudden you could tell, oh yes, this is all right. He hung up the phone, went out and got a ladder and came back, climbed up the ladder and came down with a little wooden box, quite an ornate little wooden box like this. And opened the box and there were a few little coins in it. And he wrote down, we could just barely read it, how much he wanted us to pay, which is a, which was the equivalent of about 15 cents, I think, 15 American cents. And we paid him the money. He put it in the little box, climbed up and put it back up above, wrapped up. Oh, no, he didn't wrap up the bread. He just handed us the bread and everybody cheered and was, <laughs> it was, it was a wonderful experience. It was just a marvelous experience. And we took our bread. We went to the car, we drove out into the country. It, this was in the mountains, like I say, and it was a very, very beautiful. Uh, Bulgaria is a very beautiful country, actually. And uh, we found a place we could spread out a blanket and sit down. We had sausage and we had cheese and things that we brought from Germany. So uh, we uh, had our evening meal sitting on the ground there. Then we drove into, uh, into Sofia and uh, found a hotel there. It was a very nice experience, and we not one word was spoken in a language that either party could understand, the other party could understand. So um, in full, full agreement with what uh, Harry Faber said, um, it is easy to do, it is relatively easy to do transactions like that if you really want to understand. Just like Harry said about the butcher in France, um, they knew what we wanted, and they didn't have much else to offer, and nothing else. They had actually nothing else to offer. But it was possible to do the communication, and everybody smiled and laughed and had a nice time at it. And it was a very unusual situation for them, it was an unusual situation for us, but uh, everybody had a good time. Speaking of France, however, I do want to point out something, I don't know if Harry is aware of this, but... Um, Fifty years ago, it wasn't like it is today. That butcher probably would not have understood him. They didn't want to understand. The French were very proud of their language. They loved, apparently, the sound of their own language, and they didn't. They had no understanding for people who didn't speak their language. And, in fact, um, it was very difficult to get anything done in, in, in France. And that is exactly, that, that's proof of the situation. They didn't really want to understand. Nowadays, business earning here... 
getting the Euros is more important than uh, national pride. So they're not proud of their language anymore in that sense. And they make an effort to, to, to speak with others. They actually learn English now oftentimes. So, um, and, and also there are always people who are different. There are always people who want to understand it. Uh, however, we had situations where we actually w walked into a store knowing exactly what we want, pointed at what we wanted, and the person refused to understand us, and we walked out again without getting what we wanted. So it's it's a question of really wanting to understand. If you were German at that time and you went into a French place, it was good. It was uh, it was altogether possible that you would be really treated poorly. So um, there is much more to, to communication and to understanding than than just speaking the language. Okay, for my final story, I see there's already 60 minutes going past here, so I'd better kind of wrap this up with a story that um, my wife Karen and I met 35 years ago, I think, taking a French class. Um, we both, Karen had lived in France, she'd also lived in Tunisia and Northern Africa, so uh, she spoke a little bit of French, and I loved the sound of French. And I had other reasons that I wanted to learn French, but um, we went to this, we took a French class for kind of a adult evening school, and we met there. Well, our meeting there had other consequences, of course, since we've been married now uh, for many years, but um, uh, we tried very hard to learn French. I, in my own manner of doing things, memorized <laughs> memorized the textbook. Uh, I could repeat all of the all of the conversations in the textbook wrote and the other people in the class made fun of me because of this but uh, it was the only way I knew to to uh, to, uh, to try to get these words into my mind. I had, I had a great deal of difficulty learning any French at all as you'll see. So after about, I think it was about two years of taking French courses, I learned that our French teacher was going to go down to, to southern France. And I had a good friend in Marseille. Um, he was, at that time, he became, had become professor, uh, head of the Department of, um, of, neuro, of neuro, Neurophysiology at the University of Marseille. And uh, he and his lovely Japanese wife, I had been in tubing when I, when I was at the university. In fact, we had gotten our PhDs at the same time. So we, uh, I called him up and I said, uh, I'd like to come visit you. And he said, yes, that'd be wonderful. So I hitched a ride with, the, with our French teacher who was going down there. And uh, when we got down there, uh, I actually hitched through the countryside from from Orange down to Marseille, seeing a lot of wonderful sights in the meantime. Uh, the Provence is a beautiful area uh, of France, of course. And um, so when I got there, uh, Nicola, my friend, uh, picked me up and went to their very nice house. They had a beautiful house. And uh, on the second day I was there, I believe, I was outside with him. We were looking at something, I don't remember what, but his neighbor came over and he introduced his neighbor to me, who was a pilot, an aircraft pilot for, for Air France. And the two of them, his, his pilot friend was quite excited about something, so he told him a story and I understood a few words. Uh, the main one was voler, which means to fly, and um, it uh, the story I understood the word lawn or grass, and I understood um, a lot of other things, or I thought I did in, in any case. And the police came. He told he yes, I understood also that the police came, and so I understood then that he flew in, in an Air France jet and had to make a landing on the, on grass rather than on the, air, in, on the tarmac of the airport. 
And um, the police came and so on and so forth. There was just one word that he kept repeating that I had not understood. I assumed that it was part of the aircraft that had failed. And that was the word tondeuse. And I had no idea what this word meant, but I was sure it was some mechanical thing in the aircraft. So anyway, we the, the conversation ended and we went into the house. And uh, later that evening, we were having a glass of wine. And I said to my friend, uh, I didn't understand all the details of that story about the, 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 the emergency landing he made. And Nicola looked at me and he said, emergency landing? What are you talking about? And I said, well, he told you a story out there. And, and he said uh, that they had to land on the grass and the police came. And he looked at me and he said, Oh, no, 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 he said. Uh, <laughs> his lawnmower was stolen out of his garage. <laughs> the word volet also, mean, also means to steal. And Tondeus is a lawnmower. So, um... With that, I, I gave up. I pretty much gave up on the idea of learning French. I came back to Germany and married Karin, and we lived happily ever after. Thanks for listening. Bye.